Food prices are going up. A sixth of the world's wheat is impacted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we just experienced a worldwide pandemic and on and on and on. When it comes down to it, could you grow all your own food if you had to? This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 52 on August 5th, 2022, coming to you out of Low Tech Institute's recording room in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be talking with Bill Robichard, who's been self-provisioning for two years. We'll also have Institute updates. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find both of our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts, so unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on that advertising. While all our podcast videos and other information are given freely, they take resources to make. And if you're in a position to help support the work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Institute. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website, lowtechinstitute.org. Uh, today, I'm joined by Bill Robichard, president of the Saula Foundation for Animite Mountain Conservation. We met at the Wisconsin Garden Expo last spring. He lives in Wisconsin's Driftless area and has been growing and gathering his own food since the pandemic started. Hi, Bill. Thanks for, for joining me. And when I say growing and provisioning your own food since the pandemic started, um, I mean, um, you were probably doing gardening and other things before that, right? But uh, tell us what you've been doing since the pandemic started and, and uh why did you start uh, doing what you're doing? All right. Well, it kind of, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Scott. It's great to sure, be Bill. here with you. Um, yeah, I live on a, I rent a farmhouse on a fair bit of land north of Barneveld, Wisconsin. And yeah, I've got pretty big vegetable gardens. Uh, my deer hunt, I do quite a bit of trout fishing, too much sometimes, um, foraging, you know, morels and so forth. And it was actually before the pandemic. It was January of 2020. I'd been over to visit my girlfriend in Switzerland. And I was flying home, just kind of idly thinking about what was waiting at home on my canning shelves um, and in my freezer, you know, and what I was going to be eating. And the thought just crossed my mind. I wonder how long I could go without going to the grocery store, just mm. eating down through what I have. Mm-hmm. And I decided to try it. Um, and I'm still at it two and a half years later. So wow. that was January of 2020. And I haven't been grocery shopping. The last time I, Karina and I, we went grocery shopping for Christmas Eve dinner in Switzerland on December 24th, 2019. And I haven't been grocery shopping then. I have been to grocery stores to buy tea and coffee. Mm -hmm. And twice to get provisions um, for Thanksgiving dinners, extra stuff that I didn't grow. Sure. But pretty much then, since other than that, I've just been figuring it out. And so uh, I imagine before this, so you'd already been doing some stuff. What, um, (laughs) what's the biggest change that you've had to take on board since doing this? Or what's the, if, if there was one big one you could put your finger on. Um, well, I've had to do a bit more planning, you know, about what you know, I can't just pop into the grocery store and grab something and bring it home to cook it. It takes a yes. bit more forethought. But what I have learned is um, it's not that difficult. Um, and I think I'm handly handicapped because right now my partner is in Switzerland most of the time and I'm here. Doing this alone is a lot more challenging, I think, mm. than if you were two people or three people. Because mm-hmm. when you're planting all the food, you know, cultivating it, harvesting it, preserving it, processing it, cooking it, and doing the dishes, that can make for some long days, you know, you're not doing it full time. Right. Um, and I do want to make clear, I'm not, I'm not being like a fundamentalist about this. I have not changed the pattern of which I go to cafes and restaurants and grab a meal. And yeah, when I go out trout fishing, I'll stop at Quick Trip and get a bag of chips and an orange juice, you know, in, sure. in the car while I'm trout fishing. But I have not gone grocery shopping to assemble a meal in two and a half years. And what I have learned is, so I, 
uh, there's, I'm lucky to have um, neighbors on my road. A couple of guys, they have three dairy cows that they hand milk. I get wow. dairy from them. And I do, I have bought some flour. There's a local mill near where I live in Ridgeway, Wisconsin. I can get flour from. And then other, I have a nephew who lives in Italy. He produces his own olive oil. And I get oh, sure. olive oil yeah. from my nephew. <laughs> I can make butter from the dairy. Um, and stuff like my daughter who loves to cook when she comes to visit me. Um, you know, she'll go shopping and leave extra stuff behind. I have bought sugar because I make wow. my own kombucha. Um, mm. Honey, I trade for from a neighbor with maple syrup, or I just use maple syrup. So what I found, Scott, is if I have uh, half a dozen laying hens, mm -hmm. and what I found is if you have dairy, eggs, and flour, mm -hmm. you can make and a vegetable garden, you can make one hell of a lot of good food. I yeah. mean, quiches, pies, crepes. Um, sure. If you have those things, there's an awful lot you can do with it. So what's been fun is um, it's kind of challenged me to learn to make my own stuff. So last night I made my own cream cheese for the first time. Oh, wow. <laughs> I learned how to make cream cheese last night. Very simple because I have a recipe. I learned how to smoke my trout that I catch. And I have a recipe for smoked trout dip that requires cream cheese. Oh, there you go. So then I learned how to make cream cheese. So it's this wonderful kind of rippling effect. You know, I keep <laughs> learning how to make more and more things but i'm not really an expert in all of this but sure. i've just had fun figuring it out yeah and you uh chronicle a lot of this um on your blog uh which you can find at uh, um let's see birdinthebush.net uh which i'll link to in the show right. notes and is has that been going right. on b yeah. before you started uh the self-provisioning or was that uh in conjunction with it to share what you're doing no but i did it I, I was on the plane and i i do a fair bit of writing i was writing before this when i was on the plane i thought oh, i wonder how long i can go without going to a grocery store and then the second thought was hey i think i'll start writing about it so the <laughs> blog was a consequence of the decision to, um, to uh, try not going to grocery store and then just chronicling the experience by uh, i put up a couple of posts a month about yeah what's going on and how i'm doing it and one thing that you pointed out on there that I found really useful and that I've kind of been incorporating into how I talk about this sort of stuff is that you say uh, nobody is self-sufficient, which I think a lot of people mm -hmm. who dream of growing all their own food or having their own little farmette or somehow, you know, uh, self-provisioning, they think about being self-sufficient. Um, and you say that that's kind of a, a misnomer or a, a misunderstanding. So is that something you could unpack a little bit for Sure. Then that's what's been, that's one of the most beautiful parts of the experience is by doing this, I've not learned that I'm more self-sufficient. I've actually come face to face how I am not self-sufficient in any way. Mm. I'm completely dependent on the earth, my compost pile, the sun, you know, my neighbors for bartering. What it does is it's, it's deep in my it's deep in my understanding of dependence on other things mm. that um, self-sufficiency doesn't exist. And I'm even more, if you want to think you're self-sufficient, mm -hmm. just say, well, I'll just take my paycheck and go to the grocery store and buy a meal and boom, you're no, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's actually gives more of a sense of self-sufficiency than what I'm doing because I mean, I'm so dependent on, the soil in my garden and the sun and my hens and my neighbors to trade for things, you know, we barter back and forth, things that I don't have that I need and they have. It's actually deepened the sense of, of interconnection, you mm -hmm. know, with the world and with the living things. I mean, you look at my compost pile, I've actually, um, I'm starting a writing project to just, you know, writing one little passage about everything that's in my compost pile because that's a that's a chronicle of my life for example the leftovers from the memorial party we held for my late brother two years ago went into the compost pile mm -hmm. um you know the richness that's in that compost pile that's then going into the garden is a beautiful beautiful thing mm -hmm. um so that's the and that's that's a really helpful i think a useful thing for us to remember because Humans, 
you know, encoded in our DNA is to be a cooperative group living species. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're flocking birds. We're not eagles. We're crows. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we're aware of that and understand of that and that move in that in community in any way we could find it, the better we're going to feel emotionally. Mm -hmm. That's my two bit theory. So. Yeah, no, we're definitely looking back evolutionarily and, and, and through human history, we are definitely a gregarious species. We're one of the primates that you know, uh, groups together and yeah, there's conflict sometimes within the group, but the groups that are more cohesive tend to do better yeah. than, than the individuals. Um, and, I'm, and I just, you know, and, and I think in our, you know, not to get on the soapbox, I think in the United States of America, that's a bit of an uphill climb because our, yeah. you know, our heroic model is Clint Eastwood riding his right. pony alone in the high plains. Um, rugged individualism, right. you know, self-sufficiency, all that stuff. And I was even thinking this morning in the context of, you look at the distribution of farms and farming communities in the United States versus Europe and mm. Asia. Mm -hmm. In nearly every culture I know in Europe and in Asia, everybody lives together in a village. And in the morning, they go out to mm. the fields. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their fields surrounding the village but the community comes back together at night and they, they interact as a community mm -hmm. otherwise. But in the U S you have one farmhouse here on a 40 and another farmhouse there mm -hmm. on his, you know, 120 and another isolated farmhouse here on their 240. It's a very different model where it's all these isolated farmhouses, not living in community. And that's just, you know, sort of an historic um, accident or what you yeah. want to call mm -hmm. it of how the U S was settled. Um, so we, it's, I think the importance of community may not be as intuitively apparent to us in this country as it is in other cultures. So mm -hmm. we have to pay a little bit more attention to it I mean, for our own well-being. Yeah, I think Americans are self-selecting for those that, well, for those that came here voluntarily, they chose to pack up and leave. Right. Um, and, Those are the ones. <laughs> you know, they, they're kind of self-selecting for being, uh, the, maybe, I don't know, adventure seeking is the good loners. way. Loners, yeah, true. Uh, but they, right. you know, they, they're they willing to do that. And and that ethos, I think, is passed down pretty strongly in our culture. That's one of the things that I try and always focus on is, um, especially to be palatable to Americans, I talk about things that we do at my organization of being a good uh, household uh, or community scale uh, sorts of solutions. Cause we don't talk about national scale solutions because it's kind of outside of our lane. Number one, but number two, I feel like Americans um, have less buy-in of, of large national projects than, than we do with something that you can see and feel and, and, and get involved with in your community. So a, a community biodigester to make cooking gas um, would be a lot more palatable to a lot of Americans than say a national, you know, some sort of national infrastructure, like a, a large uh, improvement of the train system or something like that, which I think would also be useful, yeah. but it's just not, right. it, it's not something that everyone wants to agree to invest in. Um, yeah, so kind of since you've started, uh, so it's been over two years now, um, if you were to start all over again, is there anything you would do differently um, or um, some things you would maybe uh, get rid of or maybe maybe take on board earlier? Um, I wouldn't do it alone. <laughs> one thing. Yeah. Um, no, nothing jumps out. I. That's good. Um, one of the best things I got was from you at your talk at Garden Expo of how to preserve eggs. Oh, you know, sure. putting them in lime water because yeah. my hens shut down because I'm really dependent on eggs. I leave a lot, eat a lot of eggs and use a lot of cooking. And my hens, you know, pretty much shut down in November and they don't start up again until February or you mm. know, something like that. So your technique for submerging eggs in lime water and preserving them, I've started saving excess eggs. So I just want to put a shout out for oh, that. Good. Um, little technique um, yeah. and it's no, not I mine mean, it's a historic technique I just yeah proof. yeah I learned it from yeah. you yeah and I'm now teaching it to other people so there you go this is a linear community yeah right uh, an ancestral community but uh, no nothing else really jumps out um, as I said I the jury is not out I'm still figuring this out yeah um, but 
it has been kind of a loaves, loaves and fishes experience. I keep expecting to run out of food, mm. and I just never do. And part of it is it was amazing when I started you know, eating through my cupboards. God, the, the food that I found in the back of my cupboards that I could still eat that I'd forgotten about, you know, bags of pasta and you know, sure. cans of beans and sure. bags of whole wheat flour. I went a long time just eating through stuff in my cupboard that I forgot I had. Right. But, you know, our, our experience, similarly to you, just through happenstance, we decided to simulate, you know, what would happen if fossil fuels no longer existed and could we grow our own food? And we started also coincidentally in January 2020 before we knew that there's a pandemic coming. Um, so, you know, we did do a little bit of, I guess you'd say last minute shopping, and then we kind of shut down and didn't go to the grocery store. And we went a full year, um, you know, other than, you know, at the time we had a one-year-old uh, child. So we did get milk because we're not going to compromise his, you know, we didn't have access to cows next door. Um, and really, yeah, uh, our experience was similar to yours. We ate through a lot of our stuff and um, it, you know, we kept, kept finding new things to eat. Um, but unlike you, like I said, we didn't have cows next door, so we didn't have a source of cooking fat. We couldn't have butter. Um, once we ran out and, uh, cooking oil, that was our big, that was our big Achilles heel, something to cook, some sort of fat to cook in because venison fat is yeah, not really palatable. So you're lucky to have the, the cows, cows nearby. Yeah. And a nephew in Italy. So yeah, hey, yeah. I, I, one occurred to me that I, I am learning to do, and you're right, one, if I was doing it over, I, I do not advise it starting it in the middle of January without a shopping trip to kick you off. Yeah. I just came home, got off the plane in early January and said, oh, let's see what I can live off of <laughs> at the absolute minimum time of the year for right. foraging or hunting or fishing or anything. That's I wouldn't good. recommend that. The second one, I, I'm really paying attention now to um, um, efficiency of gardening, where what's the maximum amount of food I can mm. get that I like to eat with mm. minimum labor. So like a lot of us, I love perennials, raspberries, rhubarb, asparagus, mm. you know, or kind of asparagus is number one. You don't have to do anything to it. And I get really good food early in the year. Mm. You know, rhubarb is another one. And so I, now I, I garden kind of strategically with what, what food output, number one, can I get with a minimum of labor, a food that I really like, and also one that doesn't put time pressure on me to really catch it at the harvest at the right time. Oh, sure. Kind of like, you know, if you don't catch broccoli within a couple few days, then it starts to turn yellow and bitter and that's right. it. You, you've lost it. Or tomatoes or like that, or beans, you know, they get tough. So I've really started to, I plant more and more stuff that's a bit more forgiving, especially stuff that has a long harvest window. Mm. My top of the list, and also easy to preserve, the minimum labor to preserve right. it. So I'm looking at what's the most food I can get for minimum labor. Top of my list right now are, you know, hard shelling beans. Mm -hmm. I just plant them, grow them on a trestle. And they just hang there. Nothing eats them. Mice don't seem to bother them. So I think last year I didn't harvest my beans till like January. <laughs> and then all I have to do is I brought them all in, you know, all dried in the pods and I shelled them by the fire and I just put them in a jar. Done. And I make oh. fantastic bean soups and stews throughout the sure. winter. So shelling beans are one. Roots like parsnips, beets, carrots, they tend to have number... And they also will last a long time into the winter. I mean, I can leave yeah. the parsnips in the ground till March. I've harvested carrots in February and they don't take much preservation. You, know, you just throw them in the refrigerator and they last a long time. So I, I am tending to pivot more towards things like that than planting things that have a very narrow harvest window and take a right. fair bit of work to preserve. I mean, right. there's a bit of labor to preserve tomatoes or any of that stuff sure. compared to beans that you just throw in a jar. So it doesn't mean I deprive myself of, you know, fresh tomatoes or right. beans or cucumbers, but right. So, but I, if you look at my garden now, there's a lot more of those winter root vegetables planted mm -hmm. and beans on a trellis, shelling beans. That's I've been noticing that also. And, and this year, especially it's like, Oh, I have lots growing in the garden, but none of it's for right now. So it looks like there's a lot going on, but it's not like we're bringing in baskets full of things every day. Um, mm -hmm. I did bring in, for example, I, 
right now in my garage, I have a wheelbarrow that has a giant tarp full of dried uh, field peas or um, soup peas um, that have to, I have to run through my little drum thresher to get all the, the peas uh-huh. out. But I have, you know, yeah. it's, it's been dried outside and I, I got the rest of it dried and under, under a tarp before it rained today. Uh, but you know, I have like two bales of, of peas to go through to, to thresh. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, it's all, it's all for the, for the winter really. Um, yeah. but yeah, some tomatoes, some cucumbers, but not as, not as heavily as, as, uh, as one might think with a big garden. Another thing I'll I put out is I've been, you know, I, just for fun and for food, I do a fair bit of trout fishing. In different mm-hmm. Um, and I've, you know, been meeting other trout fishing and having conversations with them because there's this thing going on where, you know, the moral high ground is held by catch and release trout fishermen. And I could oh, sure. sense this when I really started getting into the trout fishing when I moved back to Wisconsin several years ago. And it's sort of like you're a bit of a moral pariah if you keep, you know, a few trout to take home to dinner. Mm. And I just... So I've been starting to have conversations with some other trout fishermen about this. Um, because number one, the, the trout resource in the Driftless area is extraordinary. Some of these trout have 5,000 trout per stream mile. Wow. Um, we may only had three or 400 you know, in the 1970s. The, all the habitat restoration the DNR has done and Trout Unlimited has a huge beneficial effect and they've mm. figured some things out. And the other thing I would say, you know, Who's holding the moral high ground? Is it somebody who catches and releases 20 trout and then goes home and cooks for dinner a piece of salmon flown in from a thousand miles away on a fossil fueled mm. airplane? Mm-hmm. Or me, who keeps two or three trout out of 5,000 trout per mile and takes them home and puts them in a frying pan? Right. And for me, what I also really value about what I'm doing is for me, you know, going to the stream, catching the trout, getting in my net. That's only part of the experience of fishing, hunting, and foraging. Mm-hmm. I love giving gratitude to the trout with a lot of grief for killing it mm-hmm. and honoring it by taking home and eating it and sharing it with my family and friends or smoking them. That, that whole thing is part of the experience of mm-hmm. fishing for me or hunting or gardening. It'd be kind of like catching really release trout fishing. And it's like, okay, I'm going to grow some tomatoes and just go out and look at them on the vine and see how pretty they are <laughs> and right. you know, never doing, never do anything with them. I just, I just don't get it. Um, <laughs> so, so it's something I, and I'm starting to talk to guys in the DNR about because the, some of the trout fishing regulations are really, really restrictive in these mm-hmm. in some streams because it's driven by the kind of catch and release fly fishermen from urban centers and trout unlimited and just want to sure. for like, catch and release museum fishing and i don't really think that's to the good of either our connection with nature or mm-hmm. to our own well-being so, well and i think a lot that, of... i mean not that everybody has to do it but if mm-hmm. you want to catch and release fine but if you don't want to catch and release you should be allowed to take some trout home for dinner in an extreme that is three thousand or five thousand trout per right month. well i feel like uh I, you know i also um hunt deer and because the generation of people who, uh, where everybody hunted are, are, are kind of fading. Um, there's a lot more deer out right now than there have been. The deer populations are extremely high, which causes not only crop damage and all that sort of thing, which is, you know, less concerning for me than, you know, say car fatalities and, and, yeah. uh, in, you know, um, painful deaths for the deer and things like that. They, they become, and also because we don't have wolves or other predators that, you know, keep the populations right. in check. Um, these are resources that are slightly running out of, out of control a little bit. And if we had some sort of situation where people had to grow or eat a lot more of their food, it's kind of useful that we have built up these stocks of, of wild food and game that, you know, are otherwise ignored. It's just whether or not we have the skills and knowledge to unlock that, that food in our, in our environment anymore, because we have become so, like you say, used to just, uh, you know, catch and release fishing and then going to the store to buy a, to buy something um, already yeah. dressed and clean and ready for the table. Got a piece of cod. Right. Uh, and, yeah. And in my experience, as I said, I didn't, I didn't, start this as some sort of crusade 
you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to prove a point by not going to the grocery store. It was just, it really was just on a whim. Well, I wonder how long I can go without going to the grocery store. And, but what I found in the course of doing it is I realized going to the grocery store was just kind of a habit. Mm. I didn't really have to do it. It's just like I'm driving home from somewhere and oh, I'm hungry and I don't know what's at home for dinner. So I'm going to go to the grocery store sure. and just buy some stuff and throw something together. It was really what I've been surprised that I, I never could have predicted it would be so easy to go two and a half years without going grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, you know, if somebody living in an apartment in, you know, Madison or Janesville would have a much tougher sure. time. Sure. I am gifted. I have a big yard with lots of garden space. I have those five hens, which are keep pumping out eggs. Um, yep. I do deer hunt. I do fish. But I mean, it's everybody could do a little bit more. Everybody can, you know, put yeah. a pot of herbs on their windowsill. Yeah. You know, a yeah, lot of especially. stuff we can grow in container gardens or just on a, you know, a straw barrel. So I think we could all we could all do a bit more, and I think we will feel better about it. There is something deeply satisfying mm. about eating on a plate something that you produced and procured yourself in partnership with nature, you know, with the soil, with the sun, <laughs> with the rain. That's a deeply satisfying experience, and that's why I can that's why I continue to do it. It's not a hard, I'm not like struggling and white knuckling. No, I'm yeah. not going to go to the grocery store for, you know, another 173 days to prove a right. point. No, it's just kind of fun now. I don't, right. I'm not, I'm not, I do it because I enjoy it. Not really right. to prove anything. And so with, uh, well, it's kind of a two-part question. So, you know, we've seen gas prices go up and come back down and food costs go up and down and the wheat shortage maybe starting to be uh, come un unstuck, but still not great with the harvest uh, happening right now in, in Ukraine and Russia. Um, water shortages out West perennially in the U.S. Um, what are your, specifically your plans for the near to long-term future with, with your food um, and also how would you feel about a lot of people trying to do something like this? Is it, would it be sustainable on a larger scale? Um, or would we just have, uh, people starting to bump into one another when they're trying to, uh, self-provision? Oh, I, I think I, man, I don't think much about the future in those terms. So I don't know. I always, I just always hope I'll figure it out because you know, I can't really predict the future. Sure. I, my experience is the more people who do this, the easier it'll become for everybody mm. because I'm really blessed. So here's an example um, that I just started writing about for my next blog post, which mm -hmm. is provisionally titled God Bless the Neighbors. It'll probably be up in the next day or two. On Friday or Saturday last week, I got a, I have these wonderful neighbors along my road. One of them called me up and said, hey, you know that wild blackberry patch on the edge of our restored prairie? I said, yeah. Boy, it's just dripping with blackberries. You want to come and pick some? Ah, sure. I went up and I picked like three pounds of wild blackberries. Mm -hmm. um, and then they no longer garden because they've you know, got a little bit older. Their health isn't so good. And I just, you know, Mary comes down and she just goes through my garden and picks whatever she wants. On Monday, I got home uh, midday mm -hmm. and there were two pints of blueberries on my front porch with a nice note from another neighbor. Hey, Bill, thought you might like some fresh blueberries. You just picked at 11 this morning. Jeez. And these are people in December. I always trade them maple syrup for a Christmas tree. They let me cut, cut a Christmas tree on their property and nice. I pay them in maple syrup and Swiss chocolate. So suddenly I have access to berries because my raspberries and my strawberries did crap this year. Yes. And, um, I do buy strawberries from an Amish guy near Lafarge, but he didn't have a good strawberry year. But the more people do this, mm -hmm. and that's what I've done. I, we have this little community along my road. Another neighbor, I trade maple syrup for tomato plants every year. They have a little mm -hmm. greenhouse. They grow my tomato plants and give them to me and I plant them every year. This would be much harder if I didn't have these neighbors. Right. So I think it'll... The more people are willing to try this, the more fun it becomes and the easier it becomes because then you have a community. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing I've seen um, as part of my uh, work trying to save this animal, this Saula, which lives only in Laos and Vietnam. 
I spent a lot of time up in rural Lao villages in the mountains of uh, Laos and Vietnam. And I've seen a Lao villager cannot live alone on his own. One person living in a tropical forest in a village cannot produce enough food really to feed themselves. Sure. You have to be in a village and you have to be married. You know, it's a lot, a lot of it's an economic relationship with one partner doing whatever, one fishing while the other one's, you know, winnowing the rice or whatever. So all of this is much easier to do in community than mm. trying to do it alone. So, yeah, I think more people do it. It'll be easier for all of us. I've been trying to come up with an alternative to the idea of self-sufficiency, and I haven't come up with something that yeah. rolls quite off the tip of the tongue with yeah. something like locally dependent or something like that um, kind of gives the you idea, know, but it's not as as poetic as I'd like it to be. Um, no, you're right. We need a new word like intersufficiency or something that yeah. really, because um, anybody who thinks they're self-sufficient is, I mean, pretty. I don't do anything. I put, yeah, okay, I do maintain the soil a bit. I throw compost on it, but I put seeds in the ground in spring. Uh -huh. I might water a bit, but then it's pretty much up. My my higher power is photosynthesis in the sun <laughs> and the microbes in the soil. Yeah, They're the ones who are, so I, yeah, I go out and I see my, you know, tall bean plants and my huge tomatoes. Oh, look what I grew. Mm -mm. No, I didn't. The sun grew those and the soil did. Yeah. All I did was put the seeds in the ground. You know, I, I'm the minor player in this, yeah. in this, this agricultural partnership. I often feel like I'm just trying to nudge, nudge things in the way that I'd like them to go. And hopefully they go that way yeah. <laughs> out in the garden. I exactly. Can't, I can't yeah. force anything to do anything. It doesn't want to. Exactly. Especially when, yeah, sometimes you really want it to grow, but you know, uh, I have some sort of wilt attacking my tomatoes and, you know, I, nothing I can do. Um, well, maybe later in the year, I'll trade you tomatoes for whatever didn't work in my garden this year. There you go. Well, and I have wheat. My, herb, my, my herb garden did crap. I just, I have this suspended animation herb, herb garden. I don't, I, maybe it's just because it was such a dry year. Mm. So I'll trade you tomatoes if you have like some thyme and rosemary <laughs> squirrel swap <laughs> sounds good so um i think before we run out of time here uh, uh via zoom we should probably uh start to wrap up but uh just as a reminder um the, the blog was uh bird in the uh and your foundation is um saola foundation which i'll spell s-a-o-l-a foundation.org um so you can find out more about um, bill's professional work and also his his home uh, provisioning or local, local, uh, local dependence or whatever you, whatever we got to figure out. Some sort of, yeah. yeah. Interdependence. Um, but yeah. So thanks so much for uh, chatting with me today, Bill. Okay. Thanks very much for having me, Scott. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bill. Well, thanks again to Bill for taking the time out to chat with me today. Um, and he's lucky, like he says, to live out um, where he's able to do a lot of self-provisioning. But I think for everybody, it kind of comes down to where can you be locally dependent rather than um, completely self-sufficient? Because being completely self-sufficient is, is not really, a, I don't think, a goal worth attaining. Uh, much better to have a community uh, to work together with. So thanks again to Bill for that. And uh, now we'll talk about, real briefly, a couple of Institute updates. Uh, we have posted a new workshop uh, that will be coming up in August. Uh, we will be turning uh, flax into linen. Uh, I just harvested the flax. It's drying in a greenhouse right now. Um, and then we will be turning that into linen fiber um, and then spinning it into linen thread uh, with Master Spin and Holland Kennan. Uh, you can find out details about that on our website, lowtechinstitute.org, and sign up. I uh, still have plenty of space in that class. You can also sign up to our listserv where you will find out about other classes coming up this fall, uh, like we should be doing one on solar hot water heaters and also one on thatching. So check that out, lowtechinstitute.org. That's it for this week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted and co-produced by me, Scott Johnson, and co-produced and edited by Hina Suzuki. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute recording room. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed the free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. 
Thank you to our Forester and Land Steward level members, Marilyn Skirpon and the Hanvases for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find more information about the Low Technology Institute membership and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us also on social media and reach me directly. I'm Scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Strange Enough off the album Leftovers by Huizna. That song is in the public domain, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike license, meaning you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks, and take care.